SJC 12062, Brenda J. V. Paul R. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Brooks Ames for Brenda James. I, I'll say at the outset that uh, I was asked by the clerk not to refer to the appellant uh, by his full name. And I, I think it raises an interesting issue. Uh, in the brief that we filed, I pointed out that in other clerk magistrate proceedings that have ended up coming before uh, this court, because of 211-3 proceedings, the court has not impounded the proceedings. Uh, I was able to review the proceedings in Bradford, Victory, and Eagle Tribune uh, in the clerk's office. And, and it seems to me that what this points up is that when a police officer is the defendant, uh, when an application for a criminal complaint is brought, there's a heightened sensitivity. And police officers, it seems to me, get a excessive amount of deference uh, in our system. And this is, this is one example of it. Um, before, before I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit perplexed here because in this particular case, it was brought before the magistrate uh, in the same district where the police officer worked. But ultimately, it was sent to Dedham and decided. So you ultimately did get the matter decided by a clerk magistrate who was not in the same county where the police officer worked. So w w you, can, you can argue that it should, that should have happened earlier. But since it did happen, what's the problem? Well, we're, we're asking the court in its, in its capacity as supervisors of this system and the lower courts to have a, a little imagination here uh, and, and, and take our point, which is that a clerk magistrate, it doesn't matter whether the clerk magistrate is in the same jurisdiction as the police officer or not. The potential conflict of interest remains. And what the Supreme Court has said, and I think this court acknowledges, is justice must satisfy the appearance of justice. And well, why isn't review by the district court judge adequate? In this case, given the travel of the case, a clean break is necessary. A new judge in a new, in a new jurisdiction must hear the case to satisfy the appearance of justice. This is not a case where Bradford is sufficient on its own. We've gone too far uh, down the line in this case. Uh, you've seen, you, you can see the travel of the case. Uh, as, as Justice Gantz pointed out, it started out in West Roxbury. It ended up in Dedham. But there was a long detour in the Charlestown District Court, almost three years in the Charlestown District Court, which began with the case sitting in the clerk's office without a docket number for 11 months. Now, it seems to me that there is some supervisory obligation to look into irregularities like that. And from Ms. James' perspective, when you have a travel of the case that's tainted by that kind of delay, uh, unexplained delay, uh, it creates a question about the appearance of justice. I have a couple issues um, to, to, to ask you about. Um, the, the first one is, is this, um, and I'll just ask both of them pretty straightforward. The first one is uh, the, the case is the Commonwealth's case. It's not the plaintiff's case, and nothing can make it the plaintiff's case. This is the Commonwealth's case. But the second point is that we have a statute that when a misdemeanor happens, allegedly happens outside you know, the presence of the police, um, uh, that um, before there can be a criminal complaint, and there are exceptions, um, that there's a right to a clerk's hearing. So if you decide to be a police officer and go out there every day and, and risk your life, you don't get the same protection as every other criminal defendant. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that's... Well, 
Correct. But for a criminal complaint issues, for a misdemeanor outside the presence, there's, there's, a, there's a statutory right to a clerk's hearing. I understand there's exceptions to it, but there's a statutory right to a clerk's hearing. You agree with that, don't you? I, I do. Okay. I do. And that wouldn't happen here. And it, it, you would say it would happen before the district court judge. It, it, it would happen before the district court judge, but it would be the same protection in that. Where would it where would it take place? It would take place in in the court. In the public. Yes, your honor. So the police officer gets less protection than everybody else. The the police officer should get less protection in this instance where they're acting as a police officer. They're not acting as an individual citizen. This is not the the the. The, the nitty gritty of the district court where you have lots of neighbor complaints and relationship complaints. This is a complaint brought against a police officer, in this case a captain. So you've got a completely, we've got a completely reversed if we've come out your way. So the plaintiff who doesn't have a right to bring a complaint, uh, um, it's, it's the government who brings the complaint, um, is requesting that a criminal defendant not have a right that criminal defendants have for misdemeanors? Well, I don't know if it's a right. I mean, it's in a... The statutory right, there's exceptions. It, it, what is it, it's, 35A? It's, the, the, the right is to have your case to determine whether there's probable cause that you have committed a crime. And in the case of the clerk magistrate's hearing, there's even some leeway that even if there is probable cause, the clerk magistrate has some leeway to, to dismiss that case uh, regardless. And the, di and the district court would have the same... The, the same power. So it, you, what, what, we're, what we're doing is we're changing who the decision maker is. Well, now there's only one possible decision maker because if the uh, judge, if the clerk magistrate decides not to do a general continuance or see if the matter may be resolved, um, you can, you, the judge has the discretion to hear that in the district court. So now that's even one less right for people charged with crimes who are police officers. That's true. So now we have three less rights of police officers in this case that you're requesting. Yes, and, and, and I think the, the important thing to look at is look at this in the context. And I'd ask the court to look at this in the context of the case that decided uh, just recently uh, in October, where the court decided that when a black person in Boston runs from the police, the court can consider that that running from the police may be reasonable. It may be based in a reasonable fear of the racial indignity of being, prof of the indignity of being profiled. And what that case, in my estimation, stands for is that the court is not going to turn its, its, its head to systemic issues. Uh, well, I guess the question I first asked that I haven't really heard an answer to is why isn't review by a district court judge or BMC judge independently of the clerk's decision adequate to vindicate your client's rights? In this case, the answer is that the travel of the case has... I, I understand that was the first time. You said that the first time, but I just want to say if, if you're asking us to use our superintendent's power and to take this out of the hands of the clerk magistrates, why are district court judges and BMC judges ill-equipped to make unbiased decisions? No, I think I, I, if, if I've suggested otherwise, I, I don't mean to. Uh, I believe that that is an adequate remedy for Ms. J for Ms. James and in the, in, in the run of cases, I'm not asking a single justice to decide every case that's brought against the police. In this case, because there had been so many irregularities, uh, including uh, an order from the administrative justices saying that Ms. James was entitled to a Bradford hearing, but she never got one. Given that there were these irregularities, it seemed that the best thing to do was to bring it up uh, and, and have a neutral justice, single justice, decide the facts of the case. But in the, the rule that we're asking for across the board would be to allow in every instance where a police officer is charged with a crime or, or a complaint is brought against a police officer by an individual, that case would be heard by a district court judge. That, that's, that's the ask. That's the request that we're asking the court to, 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 the rule we're asking the court to impose. The, the assumption being that the magistrates are, are, have such an affiliation with the police that they are, they are inherently biased. 
Yes, in, or, or, either that they're inherently biased or there's the appearance of bias. And there's, there are, uh, in, there, there's the relationship which comes, there's a financial relationship. Uh, police officers call uh, clerk magistrates to come as bail commissioners, so they receive a fee for uh, setting a bail. That's a financial relationship. That, that relationship goes beyond just the jurisdiction because we know that law enforcement is a fraternity. Uh, and a clerk magistrate may have pause in deciding a case before uh, that's possibly a criminal complaint against a police officer. A clerk magistrate may have pause. Is this going to affect my standing uh, in this court with the, uh, my duties as a bail commissioner, that's a serious concern. And I think the appearance of justice requires that these cases be heard by a neutral judge. And there are, there are many issues that this particular case raises about, uh, about, about the credibility of police and how, who is responsible for assessing that. In this case, your time is, is up, but I'll, I'll give you the, uh, the last sentence. All right. I, I, I don't want to lose track of Ms. James. Ms. James worked as a Boston police officer for 19 years. She was a community service officer. She built ties with the community, made arrests, risked her life. She had no suspensions until the incident that gave rise to the case that's before you. Uh, the suspension that was handed out to her by the captain on the same date of the incident that she brought this complaint concerning was later reversed by the commissioner. So this is not someone who ran into court uh, on a whim. This is someone who is looking uh, to the court for justice and has been pursuing this case diligently and persistently for a long time. Okay, thank you. Mr. Lewison. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I think it's, I was about to look at my clock to say good morning and good afternoon. Uh, Chief Justice and Associate Justices uh, Douglas Lewis and for the uh, appellee, uh, Paul R. And with me is Attorney Alexandra Hassel, who was on the brief uh, before the court. Um, <coughs> what this petition, and we're here before the court to ask this court to deny the petition of the appellant, uh, with no support in the record but a, a Google search, the, the appellant asked this court to abrogate the statutory scheme that works and has been working in Massachusetts that empowers uh, clerk magistrates in the district courts to hear exactly these type of probable cause uh, proceedings. Uh, in addition, as I believe the uh, Chief Justice asked and perhaps uh, Justice Lowry as well, the potential, and, and the best that appellant argues in this case is the, uh, the potential or appearance of a conflict because of the status of uh, the appellee as a uh, police captain was addressed because initially, and, and, and the, the history of this case is tortured for a, for a application, but it's not in West Roxbury. The uh, appellant was represented by counsel, uh, never complained about the hearing going before the clerk magistrate of the district court, uh, and then after that application was denied, uh, it ended up going to Charlestown. The appellant, uh, my client, the captain, at that time had become supervisor of all the the police courts for, for Boston, so out of an abundance of caution, I asked the Charleston District Court to move it to Denham, where it went, and we had a full hearing, again, appellant representative. They have a different view about that. Their view is that, uh, that it went to Denham because um, it was going to be a judge in Charleston. Well, Your Honor, that, that, that is their view, but I don't think it's correct. There is a one handwritten note in the docket in Charleston saying, for judicial review, but if the court looks at the record uh, between um, Judge Driscoll in the uh, in the West Roxbury Division, and then Chief Justice Johnson's memorandum and order, and then Chief Justice Carey's memo to Judge uh, Chief Judge Ronquillo, those all orders all said transfer for purposes of having a magistrate's hearing. If the and the record is clear, and it's before this court. They all say, 
go to another magistrate under the standards for judicial practice, we'll send it out. Only one handwritten note in a docket, unknown by whomever a clerk in the court says, uh, set up, essentially in paraphrasing, set up for judicial review. When we finally got a hearing date in Charleston, and it was an extraordinary delay, at no cause by the respondent uh, captain, I said, in order to avoid that issue again being raised, as it was raised in West Rice, let's go out, and it was set up and, and heard before the magistrate. And uh, under the standards of judicial procedure, which is what the clerks and the district courts were, were laboring under, there is a recommendation, it, and it's discretionary, it says the, where a, police, a complaint is brought against a police officer, strong consideration should be made to transfer it out of, the, out of the, um, that venue to an independent venue. And that's exactly what happened. And the record, and again, as a fundamental question, the extraordinary uh, uh, relief that is now sought by the appellant here before this court, uh, the, and I believe the Chief Justice raised this question, or, I'm sorry, maybe it was the Associate Justice Lowry, the right to have a complaint reviewed was the appellee's right. The appellant doesn't have an absolute right to have a complaint issued against the uh, respondent defendant in the court. So I mean, as a fundamental premise of this proceeding before the court, no, uh, which is being sought under two, uh, chapter uh, 211, there is no uh, violation of the appellant's rights here because she was never, no case law says that she is entitled absolutely to have a complaint issue. It's my client, the appellee's right to have the complaint application reviewed. Interestingly, the standard of judicial procedure which recommended transfer when a complaint is brought against a police officer for that potential bias. That's a little tipped upside down because as the record is clear before this court, both the applicant and the uh, respondent, uh, the appellant and appellee, were both police officers in that district. So I think that balancing act kind of leveled out a little bit because the potential appearance of uh, bias by a clerk would have equally run potentially, and this is all very theoretical, equally run to a patrol officer who the appellant was, who arguably appears more frequently in the district court, the local district court, than the captain who is the appellee uh, who is appearing. But nevertheless, it all worked. It was transferred, and it was heard before a clerk magistrate. And the appellant's request to this court is to find absolutely that clerk magistrates not just uh, need to avoid the appearance of conflict, but they just inherently, because of their position, have an, a, a, a conflict of interest with police officers. And no case says that. No statute says that. The statutes say just the opposite. They are empowered in, uh, to hear uh, um, misdemeanor uh, applications. And that, that's what occurred. Quite frankly, in many district court divisions, the district judges sit and see the same police office before them on a regular basis, and their contact is pretty much the same as clerk magistrates. It's, it's I would suggest, disingenuous to say that there's a personal or financial bias or relationship uh, between a clerk magistrate and a police officer because clerk magistrates statutorily set bail when they get called out. I mean, it's a little different. I mean, uh, the, I sat in the district court, and. Um, I would walk down to the clerk's office uh, fairly often, and the police officers would be out there taking an application for complaint. Sure. And uh, and uh, they'd be chatting with, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when they came in, they testified in a motion to suppress. I didn't ask them how what how their kid did in the little league game. And, and I'm not suggesting that there there is that, but this this entire petition suggests that that a professional relationship where a clerk may be talking to a police officer, both in their professional capacity across the, the uh, counter is ipso facto an absolute prejudice or bias or prejudice, and that's not the case. Well, I understand. Your but, well taken. I'm just saying that it's not the same relationship as the judge. It, no, it's not, and, and you're right. There is that, that, that you know, space between the, the, the litigants and the court for sure, and that's why the standard of judicial practice, uh, 302 for the district court, exists, and that's why it was applied, albeit 
after the first hearing uh, didn't go the way the appellant wanted. It was applied secondarily and went to a full-blown hearing where the appellant was represented by counsel and did not raise at that proceeding that it should not be, for, be before the clerk magistrate of the Denham District Court, uh, um, uh, South Paterna. So that proceeding went forward to address that question. And again, now we're in, in Norfolk County, um, uh, the appellant captain, uh, the appellee captain had no contacts with Norfolk. And so any potential saying, well, he's a police officer, well, in fact, she was a police <laughs> officer too. So if there's a, some sort of suggestion that, well, clerks just are going to favor police because they're in the system, well, that, that, that would have cut both ways. But unfortunately, that, that's all very theoretical. The record is completely absent of any suggestion that there was actual bias that took place or that the, the judicial proceeding that took place uh, heard by the uh, magistrate was biased in any way or that the appellant therein in the, that uh, proceeding was limited or prejudiced because of the uh, respondent captain's capacity as uh, uh, capacity, but extraordinarily, in this case, the, the appellant is asking not just for this court to abrogate the statutory scheme, but also, as, as uh, the Associate Justice Lowry mentioned, uh, that individuals, citizens of the Commonwealth, who happen to be employed as police officers, now uh, are going to have a much lower threshold for the review of uh, criminal process against them. And I, I think that's an extraordinary uh, Requests that should not be granted yeah, under the Constitution or under the, the facts in this case. A police officer or an, a citizen who is employed as a police officer is entitled to a probable cause hearing just like uh, uh, um, every other citizen of the Commonwealth. And, and nothing in this case suggests that uh, there's any reason to, to change that. Just, just but out of fairness to, um, to the appellant, they're not saying that a police officer shouldn't be. They're just saying it should take place um, in the courtroom in front of the district court judge. They're Which not, changes. They're not saying that they shouldn't have that right. Right, but but there is a reason, we have to assume there's a reason why the statutes were structured as they were. For the Don't get to argue again, and I, and I just, they're not asking that. They're not asking that, but they're asking that to change, maybe not lower, uh, Your Honor, the threshold of the standard, but change it for a one category of citizens in the Commonwealth. You're, you're right, I'm not suggesting that. They're, seeking to uh, take away the probable cause standard. Okay, thank, you. thank you, Your Honor. Thank you for your time. Court, all rise.